Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Birgit Goebel, and I'm a project management and outreach trainee at EuroClear. I would like to welcome everyone uh, to our Sharing European Histories self-guided online course. This course uh, is, of course, part of the Sharing European Histories project. It is an initiative of EuroClear and the Evans Foundation, and the project is based on five teaching strategies which were developed on the topic of European histories, and they have been created by a team of teachers, of researchers, and of curriculum developers. They are currently available and have been published in nine European languages, and there will be five more uh, languages following very, very soon. During this self-guided course, where we will dive into each of the five different strategies with local teachers and with experts across Europe to see how they have used the strategies to create and to implement lesson plans, which they have then gone on to use in classrooms. In this session, we will take a closer look at the teaching strategy on object biographies. The teaching strategy was developed by our author, Elisabetta Pereira. And the full title is Using Object Biographies to Reveal How Our Pasts Are Interconnected. So I'm very excited. Here today we have Ildiko Hegaduc, and she is uh, going to introduce us to her lesson plan, which she has adapted based on this teaching strategy. I will hand over the floor to Ildiko uh, to tell us a little bit about herself. Thank you, Birgit. So I'm, hello everyone. My name is Ildiko Hegedus. I'm a teacher of history and English, and I live and work in Hungary, in a little town called Dunakesi, which is just 20 kilometers from our capital city, Budapest. Uh, I teach uh, at a secondary school, and uh, my students are aged between actually 10 and 20. So I teach many kinds of students. Thank you, Adika. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to share the PowerPoint with all of you. Perfect. So this Sharing European Histories self-guided course consists of the five teaching strategies. Uh, today is session five, Object Biographies. Accompanying the course, we also have the live reflection sessions. These will be taking place on the 18th of November, the 2nd of December, and also the 16th of December. All of these will then be published on our YouTube channel. And uh, if you wish to know more about the project, uh, links will be provided in the description and you can check out the project page on the EuroClear website. And now to really delve into object biographies, the teaching strategy, um, as I mentioned, it was developed by Elisabetta Pereira. And the strategy's main aim is to teach about the transnationality of history. It reveals uh, the multitude of people which are involved in constructing history. And it also encourages students to really engage with history uh, from a variety of perspectives and look from yeah, a point of diversity and difference, such as political, religious, and social differences. The analysis of the historical and multicultural roots of objects also encourages a certain kind of confrontation with the dominant and state narratives of history. And it can also help to overcome differences and divisions between countries and also cultures. The close analysis of objects also allows us to draw historical attention away from military and political events, which are sometimes yeah, the main kind of dominant narrative we hear in classrooms. And instead, it diverts us towards a more social and cultural history. So without further ado, I shall hand over the floor to Ildiko, who will explain her lesson plan. Ildiko, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So um, I'm going to talk about an object, which is a public monument in my city called the Stog. 
uh, you will have a chance to see it soon, but first let's see the learning objectives. Um, I hope that students will have a better understanding of the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, which is actually a core material in Hungary, of course. Uh, then um, by using an artwork, a statue, I think it helps students uh, to understand how it can convey various messages. And this might help them to learn how to read a public monument, so how to solve and uh, understand all the symbols and messages used. And by the end of the lesson, students will understand what this specific statue means. Uh, yes, and now I would like to talk about the steps. So may I have the next slide, please? Um, first, I would like to introduce the topic by showing Actually, first I would show the first photo and then the second one. And I would ask the students uh, who they can see in the photos. Uh, they, are, they will probably recognize this person who is actually the artist himself. He used to teach art at our school. And uh, after retiring, he actually stayed there to uh, stage dramas and uh, musicals. So, uh, people will definitely, students will definitely um, recognize him. And then uh, we would talk about uh, his other, his pieces of work. There are statues and uh, plaquettes and uh, things all around Dunakasi, as you can see on the right. And uh, uh, when they list these pieces of art, they will probably mention the stalk. Uh, if they don't, can I have the next slide, please? I will show this picture. Actually, uh, the usual question with photos is what can you see in the photo? But this time I would ask the question, what can, can't you not see in the photo? So what is missing? And uh, you will see the answer soon. Uh, next slide, please. Here, see the landscape changed and we have a monument there. Uh, probably I, would not have to show these photos, but they might be interesting because they don't re remember uh, this place without uh, the statue. So um, after showing this um, statue, then um, it would be a good idea to um, kind of introduce them to the topic, so the historical topic. Uh, it depends on where I take this lesson. I planned it for um, 14, 15 euro, euro students, who didn't, haven't learned about um, the revolution so far. So I went on with uh, the next section to explain uh, the basic events to them. Um, first, I would give an outline of uh, the whole era, that is the 1950s, uh, talking about uh, the communist regimes and uh, so the West and the East and the Cold War, and also um, the, the people in Hungary and uh, who formed and who shaped uh, history. Then uh, we would come to the day of the revolution, which is the 23rd of October. And uh, to make uh, them a little bit more informed, but in a different way, I opted um, to, so I chose to show them a text from another uh, history book. Uh, we can show that uh, to our uh, spectators. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes. So uh, this is a translation of a Hungarian history course book. And what I did was um, I uh, jumbled the paragraphs. Say so the students had to work uh, in pairs, trying to figure out what came, which event came after the other. Uh, you can see the next uh, three steps on the next slide. And by doing this, I didn't want to concentrate on teaching history, um, but by reading these parts, they put the story together. So I didn't have to explain too many things uh, for them. Then uh, I think since we are in Europe, and this is a great way to discover other people's attitude towards a certain historical event, um, I would like to go on with the international context. As you can see in the next slide, yes, uh, here is the famous cover of the Time magazine. 
1956, the man of the year was not a specific man, but it was a Hungarian freedom fighter. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about why uh, this fighter became the man of the year and what his figure means to people in the West. See, we could uh, talk about uh, Western countries' attitude towards Hungary and the revolution, and also what happened after um, the revolution failed. And after talking about uh, the West, we can also cover how Eastern countries uh, reacted to the revolution. And of course, uh, we should mention how people fled Hungary and went to other places where they were accepted with uh, lots of love and, and care. So that would be the next section. And the third and the largest part would be uh, actually talking about a statue. First, we would like to introduce how the statue was born. Uh, well, you can, now you can see some Hungarian uh, text. Uh, it means that, um, so the first is the flyer inviting people, so the, the citizens, inhabitants of Dunakasi, to contribute uh, to the statue. I asked Mr. Landyal why it was so, and he said uh, the concept behind it was that it should be a monument built together, so the whole city um, gave the money, and so it wasn't the it wasn't meant to be the monument of the city, it was meant to be the monument of the people. And actually, as I heard, all the money uh, was put together, so uh, no money was needed from other sources. As you can see on the right, uh, this is a flyer um, informing in, uh, people about um, the first time, say, kind of a celebration. And then, um, we would go on and talk about, well, we talked about um, object biographies. So we would write a short biography of, um, of the statue, starting with the name. And it's a funny example because uh, as you could see, the name of the statue is the stork, probably because it's a stork, but the original name wasn't stork. It's uh, in Hungarian, it's Pannon Phoenix, but I guess you can translate it into English. Pannonian Phoenix, and it gives, it gives us the possibility to compare the two birds, say a phoenix and a stork. And uh, it, it, could be, it could involve some, some brainstorming activities using the internet or not, it doesn't really matter. You can use only a pen and um, piece of paper as well. And then we would also talk about uh, when it was born, how it was born, who's the father, and also some basic uh, ideas like the size of the statue, the materials, so these little parts. And then after this short introduction, I decided to have a closer look at the statue. So I took photos of uh, various parts and I asked the students to sit in pairs and each pair got a, got a, got a photo or can get a photo. And their task is to try to understand and try to uh, express their feelings, their ideas. And uh, after a while, kind of two, two minutes or so, I gave them um, relevant extract from um, an interview which was made with the artist. See, so actually he has explained a lot of things to uh, their readers. It uh, appeared in a newspaper in Dunakasi. And uh, I want to give it to them because some students might not have any deep thoughts and I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. So they can actually sell uh, the author's ideas as their own ideas, but uh, it makes them um, think of this so they can um, explain to their classmates. And then it, sh it should take a while. And uh, at the end of the lesson, I would read the whole, um, not the whole, but this part of the interview. And then we would discuss how well they could understand the statue. As a follow-up, uh, I planned some homework, which would be uh, to prepare for making an interview with the, the artist. 
who actually promised me uh, if I have any questions from the students, he will definitely answer them. So um, I will, we will see how it works. And uh, the homework would be to write two or three questions that they would pose to, to artists. And that would, would be the end of my 45 minute long lesson. Great, thank you so much for presenting. It was wonderful to hear about yeah, how you take an object, in this case, uh, a monument, a statue, and um, can also learn about the various different meanings behind it. Very interesting as well that um, that the artist has also agreed to answer questions uh, from the students. I'm sure that's a very special connection. Um, I have a, a question to you about the sources which you selected in your lesson plan. Uh, there are various different sources. The flyers, for example, here on this slide, the cover of the Time magazine, uh, the photos which you took and also, of course, the interview that you had. Uh, could you perhaps reflect on why you chose those particular sources and uh, what they contribute to the lesson plan? Uh, yes, I basically, I based my lesson on the statue. Actually, we could have walked there, but uh, <laughs> I don't think we, we would have arrived back in time to school. So uh, it would be nice to, but it's very difficult to climb because it's a five meter tall statue. So it's much easier to take photos. And um, uh, I was lucky to have some original photos from Mr. Lander. And um, it was really interesting because in, well, when was it in uh, 2015, maybe, I uh, took a group there. We made a tour around Dunakasi and we created an English video for uh, some pen friends. And I took several photos of uh, the stalk, which was renovated the next year. So I have, and now I went back and took some more photos. So I have three stages. Uh, recorded in photographs, and uh, I, it would be another idea to compare them. So, what was what has been changed, and what was lost? Maybe is there anything added? Say, so, but actually, I think it it uh, could be another lesson, but maybe not for history, but for for an art lesson. So that's why I chose to show them. Uh, I was really happy to see this flyer, this original flyer, and I also had some cutouts from newspaper. Uh, given to me by Mr. Landell again, but I didn't uh, put them in uh, anymore. I chose the Time magazine cover because I, I think we live in Europe and I think a historical event isn't confined to a country, especially the, this uh, 1956 revolution, which is known all over the world. And uh, it's a great way to see how uh, politics work and what See, so, yeah, there was a strange thing about, uh, for example, about the reaction of the West. They were very happy to see that there was a um, revolution against the communist regime, but they didn't have uh, any means to help the revolution itself, but they were able to help the people. And uh, it's a great way to show them how people and politics work in a different way, maybe. And uh, as for the others, um, yeah, I, I think it's all. Have I answered your question? Yeah, no, definitely. I think the range of sources is also an interesting choice because it also allows for a range of different perspectives. Like you say, the Time magazine was very much a, a Western perspective um, during the Cold War when it was very much East and West. And then you have the photos and the, even the opportunity to make a trip, make an expedition out of this um, yeah, lesson plan. If there is enough time within a 45 minute lesson, that's maybe not possible, but uh, <laughs> if it was a bit longer, yeah. it would be very, very doable. Um, but uh, they might have a look at, um, have a closer look at the statue while going home. Yeah, exactly. So I will ask them. <laughs> and I'm sure that they would. Uh, what I'm going to do now is stop sharing. And then I have a couple more questions uh, about yeah. very practical um, the lesson plan and how easy um, do you think the strategy and the lesson plan is to use in classrooms? Actually, I, I uh, liked the strategy very much. 
it was intriguing, interesting, and inspiring <laughs> for me. And uh, it's a great way to arouse students' interest, uh, especially if we can find an object that is relevant. And uh, that might be kind of difficult sometimes, but it's, it's really easy to adapt. So if you find a good object, then it's a great way because uh, uh, children don't think they are learning, but they are. Yeah. And I like these situations. And kind of related to that, because you do take a strategy and then you have to apply it to a particular example, like you say, a particular st uh, statue or a particular object. Um, what challenges actually did you encounter when you were trying to find a local example to uh, apply the strategy to? Yes, I remember our first conversation say, when we talked about objects. And I came up with some ideas, objects that are important for all Hungarians. And then uh, you asked me to be a little bit more local. And then I was a kind of frightened because we have a small city. And uh, first I said, there's nothing here. And uh, that might be the first reaction of many people. There's nothing around here, but uh, there is, a, as, as we can see, even a, a simple monument can tell us a lot of things. So that uh, could be a challenge, but um, but after a while, I think it's it's uh, it's not that difficult to find. Maybe it's difficult to find uh, secondary sources, uh, information about the life and life of that object. In this respect, I was really lucky because of uh, all the documents and uh, because having Mr. Landiel as a friend, <laughs> so he could help me a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, what you say is very true. It may seem quite daunting uh, to teachers if they want to find an uh, example which is very local to them, um, but it is encouraging that you can always find an example if you dig a little bit deep into uh, the history of uh, the local context that you're in. Um, how long would you say in terms of time did it take you to develop this lesson plan? Uh, that's very difficult to say because I usually work in a strange way, maybe. So I have an idea and I don't like to sit down and um, and uh, work it out. So I spent some time thinking about it while walking to school or while doing other things. So it's very difficult to say. Um, well, finding this object took kind of half an hour. Uh, it was more a little bit more than that because um, since I wasn't born here, so I moved to the legacy from, a, from another place, I didn't have a deep uh, knowledge of this, the history of this city, but I found um, monography about the legacy, so I had a look at that. But then it turned out that actually my very first idea was the best one. So <laughs> it, maybe it's, it's not um, very important to spend a lot of time finding something. So I think you just you should just go around and see the monuments, for example. Or if you have a museum, a local museum, then you can find objects there, and and it helps. So um, when I had the idea and uh, I had the basic structure, it wasn't that difficult. So I think I spent um, about one hour, uh, and I think that was the most. I spent more because I translated all the things into English, yeah. but um, for the Hungarian version, I think it, it was kind of a normal lesson plan. Okay, um, perfect. Yeah, obviously, like it doesn't always have to be translated and definitely if it stays within a local context, uh, then it wouldn't need to be. Um, in terms of the uh, lesson plan and, um, and the strategy, how much, or do you think the sample lesson plan that was provided in the teaching strategy uh, supports your understanding of the lesson plan? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the sample lesson is very helpful. It's not a specific lesson, so it just uh, uh, asks questions and uh, um, provides some ideas how to solve different issues. And I think that's that's really great because uh, you can think about your own lesson plan then. So it doesn't does not confine you, doesn't res restrict your thoughts. Yeah. The first I I thought it wasn't very helpful, but then I realized it was. So I, I liked it a lot. Yeah, it's it seems to be almost a template which you can very easily adapt. 
and uh, take and use for your example. So your creativity isn't limited um, because it's very, very flexible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes. As I understand, uh, you were also able to execute your lesson plan already in class with some of your students. Uh, I would love to hear some more about uh, the student feedback, how they thought it went. Uh, to what extent do you think that your students were uh, engaged or interested in uh, the lesson? Yes, uh, I executed the lesson this week. It was on Tuesday, but I promised them, I talked about it last week because I asked if they wanted to take part. And uh, on Thursday, when we had the last lesson, one student asked, say, when are we going to do this thing? Because they didn't know anything, I just think. And I said, all right, Monday, no, Tuesday, something like that. And then uh, I executed on Tuesday. They were really thrilled about it. Uh, they were kind of surprised because they didn't know what we, are, what we would be doing. And uh, they enjoyed the strategy very much. Mm -hmm. I asked for some feedback. Uh, I met them today too. And they said that the strategy uh, was really good. And uh, we arrived at a point from another place and they really liked it. So it wasn't a usual history lesson. Mm -hmm. Uh, what they didn't like was uh, <laughs> that we talked about uh, 1956 in the middle of um, <laughs> exploring the Middle Ages. So it was kind of difficult to <laughs> jump yeah. in a place which they didn't, didn't know anything about. But most of them didn't mind it. So, uh, actually, it's a very small group of only 10 students. Uh, it's kind of a um, history lesson for those who want to deal with history. So it's mm -hmm. kind of an extra lesson, uh, advanced level history lesson. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are aged 15 and uh, they worked really hard. So they said they enjoyed it. No, that's, that's... And asked me to do more. Uh, but a little bit more relevant objects. <laughs> yeah. No, that's very good to hear. I think maybe then one of the challenges which you encountered was that um, you're jumping from one time period to another and maybe students uh, don't have prior knowledge of the context or background um, of, the, of the monument statue object. In your case, did you have to provide uh, some context about maybe the 1950s or the 1956 revolution? Yeah, that's why I included the first part uh, of the lesson plan. Uh, in other places, I, I, that would be shorter, much shorter, mm -hmm. because uh, students would have a basic knowledge of things. But uh, if you have a look at the stock and you have seen uh, the photos, then I think it uh, kind of reflects all kinds of revolutions and uh, fleeing away and not being able, able to fly and uh, these aspects. So um, the wonderful thing about this monument is it, 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 it is not stuck to this period only. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, they could understand it very well. And uh, maybe it would have worked without uh, talking about uh, the 1950s too. But it was of course important, but... Uh, but I think it works without that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you mentioned that your students had said um, that this kind of lesson uh, lesson plan, this teaching strategy arrived at a point, but from a, from a way that is different to usual. How uh, do you compare this strategy to other strategies that you've developed and used as a teacher yourself? Uh, I like problem solving. See, I usually don't lecture in my history lessons. I, I like to find a problem and we are trying to solve that. And there's a, <laughs> yeah, there's a very good um, competition in Hungary for secondary school students when they have a historical event, when they have to make a decision. For example, imagine that you are Napoleon and here is the choice. What, what are you going to do? And uh, they have to say so it's a problem solving activity. They have to know the era, the period. They have to have the necessary background and they have to make a um, relevant decision and they have to support it. And I often take uh, elements of this strategy into my lessons. And I think this object biography is something similar. 
So uh, I find an object. It's not a problem, of course, but I can um, explore how it works in time and in, in space. So yeah, yeah, I, I think uh, I am using something a bit similar, but I'm gonna definitely adapt this strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's very much about problem solving, like you say, um, and really involving the students in a very interactive way, uh, which can be different from usual teaching strategies. Uh, but like you say, this is definitely up your street. Uh, what opportunities for change uh, do you think that this teaching strategy has? And if you could redo it, maybe what things would you improve on or adapt? Uh, of course, nothing is perfect but uh, this strategy is close to that definitely so i wouldn't like to change it uh, what i was thinking about um mm -hmm. it's, it would be interesting to combine more strategies so here we have this object strategy uh, yes and uh, we have some other like uh figure historical figures so it might be an interesting thing to combine the two, two strategies or just uh, linking, finding a link between objects and ideas and other strategy again, to kind of put them together. And with these five strategies, you can have a um, holistic or a whole picture of a period or of, of an event. Mm. Or maybe say that is one thing, or maybe uh, I would say, I wouldn't concentrate on one specific object like a famous monument, or a crown or whatever, uh, I would use kind of, let's say weapon. And uh, I would explore how these objects, um, so I would have a look at the function and see how this function changed in time and how it changed the object. For example, how weapons change from this period to that period. So we can explore changes in time, but also in space. For example, comparing houses in Hungary in the Middle Ages and let's say, I don't know, Siberia or France and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah, plenty of opportunities and it seems to almost combine it and combine it with some of the other teaching strategies. Uh, you mentioned the history of ideas and historical figures. I'm very aware that we're coming uh, towards the end of our time, uh, but I have one last question for teachers who uh, really want to uh, take this strategy now that they've been inspired and use it in their lessons. Do you have any final tips or advice that you would want to share? Uh, to put it shortly, use it. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really worth and feel free to adapt it to suit your needs and your students and I'm quite sure all your students will love it. Well, great. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ildiko, for taking the time to present your lesson plan, uh, but also to answer all of these questions. I'm sure that it's very invaluable for uh, students and teachers, teachers who want to use the lesson plan. All of the resources that we've talked about today will be made available in the links below um, and also on our project page. Ilziko, thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Birgit, for this opportunity. I enjoyed it, really. Thank you. And um, stay tuned for the further live reflection sessions and also recorded sessions as part of the Sharing European Histories online self-guided course. Goodbye. Goodbye.